now that we've had the opportunity to introduce the concepts of local and absolute maxima and minima, now we're going to use some algebraic techniques to figure out where those absolute maxima and minima occur. So with that in mind, I'd like to consider f of x is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 5. Now I recognize this as a quadratic function. Its graph will be a parabola opening in the upward direction because of the positive lead coefficient. I also notice that if I were to complete the square, this x squared minus 6x would require a plus 9 to complete the square, and I'll also be subtracting 9 to balance that out. The x squared minus 6x plus 9 factors into x minus 3 quantity squared, and the plus 5 minus 9 gives us a minus 4. This is known as vertex form for a quadratic function. What vertex form tells us is the location of the vertex. In this case, that vertex would be located at positive 3, negative 4. And the parabola is going to open in an upward direction. Also, if we had factored the original quadratic, we would have had x minus 1 times x minus 5, letting me know that it'll have x-intercepts at 1, 0 and 5, 0. Drawing the parabola that passes through these points. Oh boy, not the best parabola I've ever drawn, but it gets the job done. So we can see it from the graph of this parabola that not only do we have an absolute maximum at 3, 4, but this is also a local maximum since we can establish a little interval right around 3, 4 where this is the lowest point. So the absolute and local minimum occurs at the ordered pair 3, negative 4. No idea why I had that labeled as positive 4. But yeah, 3, negative 4 for this absolute and local minimum. Now again, we were able to get this through the algebraic technique of noticing that um, we had a quadratic function and applying techniques of our old algebra classes. For our next example, we'll be dealing with a rational function. So this will be 4 divided by 1 plus x squared. <clears throat> Now, if we just had the 1 plus x squared, that would be a parabola that opens in the upward direction with a vertex at 0, 1. Now, with that in mind, uh, that would be a minimum for y equals 1 plus x squared. So for the reciprocal of that, that's going to wind up being a maximum. So if I were to actually plug in x equals 0 to this, I would get an ordered pair up here at 0, 4. That is going to be the highest point on our graph, because if I plug in any negative value or positive value for x, we're going to wind up with a larger denominator than we do by plugging in x equals 0. Additionally, the denominator will always be positive, but as the denominator gets very, very large, this thing will tend toward 0. So this is just a general shape of the graph. Later in the chapter, we'll get to more specifics of how to find more um, important points on here. Now, once again, we can establish a little interval right around x equals 0, where this is the maximum value. Therefore, we are going to have both an absolute as well as a local maximum at the ordered pair 0, 4. Now, because of the asymptotic behavior that we see here, we are going to see neither a local minimum nor an absolute minimum. Rather, we can identify that the range of this function is going to be the half-open, half-closed interval from 0 to 4. Again, we never actually attain a y value of 0. We just approach it in an asymptotic fashion. Next up, we have an old standard for an absolute and local minimum, y equals the absolute value of x. Shape of this graph is the old flying v. This is also a uh, piecewise defined function. It's possible to define an absolute value piecewise as being x if x is greater than or equal to 0, and negative x if x is less than 0. Now, as a result, this function is continuous, but it is not differentiable. It's not differentiable because as we approach x equals 0, we, uh, well, let's see what happens if we take a derivative. That would be dy dx is equal to 
Well, derivative of x would be 1 if x is greater than 0, and it would be negative 1 if x is less than 0. We fail to include the endpoint because it approaches two different values from two different sides. So something that should be pointed out is that dy over dx, evaluated at x equals 0, does not exist. We get this nice sharp corner on the graph instead. However, we can still establish a little interval right around this point, and that is the lowest point on the graph due to the fact that the range of the absolute value function goes from 0 to infinity. <clears throat> so it is possible for us to say that we have an absolute and local minimum that occurs at the ordered pair 0, 0. Nothing wrong with saying that in this case. However, it should be pointed out that the derivative does not exist at that point, despite the function being continuous at that point. Now, on a semi-related note, for y equals the square root of x plus 3, that would be the standard square root function shifted to the left by 3 units. So the domain for this function is going to be from negative 3 over to positive infinity using our rules for domain. Square root function looks like half of a sideways opening parabola, so something like this. Now with that in mind, I do see that the graph does have a lowest point right here at negative 3, 0. It should be pointed out that the range of this function is going to be from 0 to infinity due to the fact that we are only dealing with the primary square root, not the negative square root. So what this does for us is it establishes that we have an absolute minimum at the ordered pair negative 3, 0. It cannot, however, be specified as a local minimum due to the fact that we cannot establish a little interval around the point where it's the lowest point because the function is not defined for values of x that are less than negative 3. So we'll point out that this is not a local minimum. Essentially what's going on here is that the two-sided limit does not exist at negative 3, and that's why we're unable to do it. Actually, I guess it's more the lack of definition when x is less than 0. So since only the right-hand limit exists here, that's why it's not going to work out. Now because the arrow indicates that it's just going to continue going on in the upward direction, there is going to be no local nor absolute maximum. For every point that's on the graph, we will always be able to point, uh, find a point with a larger y value. And last up, we have y is equal to this cubic polynomial function, x cubed minus 4x. Now through a little bit of factoring, factor out a greatest common factor of x, and then recognize that a difference of squares factors into binomial conjugates, which is something I love saying at parties when I go to parties. This will be x times x minus 2 times x plus 2. So we're going to see x-intercepts at 0, 0 for the x, 2, 0 for the x minus 2, and negative 2, 0 for the x plus 2. Additionally, this is a cubic polynomial, so odd degree with a positive lead coefficient lets me know that the end behavior is going to be up to the right and down to the left. I can also test for symmetry and see that this is an odd function. But what's going to happen is the graph of this odd function is going to look something like this. I missed my target, so I'll make my target a little bigger. Perfect. Now, in this case, I can see that based off of the general sketch that I made, that there is going to be a local maximum right about here. I also see that there is going to be a local minimum right about there. Now, I don't necessarily know where those things are occurring. This isn't necessarily going to be x equals negative 1 or x is equal to positive 1. But what should be pointed out is that for both of these, if we were to consider the slope of a tangent line in both of these cases for this nice smooth differentiable function, you'll notice that the slope of the tangent line at this point 
is equal to zero. And the slope of the tangent line up here at this point is also equal to zero. In fact, if we were to filter back through some of the other graphs that we were taking a look at, all of these maxima and minima have things in common. So for our previous graph, if we were to analyze dy dx at our absolute minimum, we would find that it does not exist. This is due to the fact that dy over dx, in this case, would be equal to 1 over 2 times the square root of x plus 3. The proof is left as an exercise to the viewer. You'll notice that negative 3 is no longer within the domain of this function since it's now in a denominator. Therefore, the derivative does not exist at that point. Continuing backwards, we already talked about this one for the absolute value, but the derivative does not exist at this point. Heading back even further, for this function, since it was nice and smooth and continuous, if we take a look at that local and absolute maximum, we see that f prime of x is equal to zero. And for our parabola on the flippy flip of this, once again, if we take a look at that local minimum, we are going to see a horizontal tangent line. f prime of x is equal to zero. If only there were a way to describe a point where the derivative either does not exist or is equal to zero. Well, here we go. C is a critical number. Or critical value of a function f. If f prime of c is equal to zero or f prime of c does not exist. As we continue our hunt for these maximum and minimum values, one of the big things we're going to be looking for will be these critical points. As such, it's important that we have this definition and we have a plan moving forward. Take a derivative, figure out where it either does not exist, or set it equal to zero and solve for the corresponding value of c.